Thank you very much, Professor DeVoe, for that introduction. Uh, thank you all of those who are involved with bringing me here. It's a great pleasure to be uh, here on your beautiful campus and have a chance to talk to you about this topic. Now, um, why the ethics of what we eat? We haven't typically thought of food as an ethical issue, although it's certainly something that we've always done. So, uh, start off with uh, this little cartoon about our uh, existence, tracing back um, uh, a few million years. We've always eaten, um, and we've always survived and reproduced, and that's how we've got where we are. But it's only relatively recently, you could say, that we've stood up and started to philosophize about what we eat, why we eat, what should we eat. And in fact, uh, the idea that this is a central ethical question is still something that people typically do not accept. We think of uh, a range of ethical issues. We've uh, been looking at ethical issues, for example, in the presidential campaign. People have been trying to find uh, things that people have done that uh, may be unethical. Uh, they may involve um, financial corruption, taking money from people to influence your vote. Um, we're familiar with that kind of lack of ethics. We're familiar with charges of lying, which is unethical. Uh, we're familiar with the idea that your sexual behavior is central to how ethical you are. But I haven't heard anyone uh, in trying to blacken anyone else's character in this campaign say, well, but what is, what is it that you eat, right? Um, isn't there a question there? Um, maybe there should be. Maybe by the time I'm through, you will think that that is indeed an issue that reflects on the ethics that people have. I certainly hope so. So, uh, let me try and make that case. But first, what are the various possibilities? There are, of course, a wide range of things that we might choose to eat or not eat on various grounds, and I can't cover them all. I'm starting with a, a list roughly like this as the kinds of choices that we might make. So, we could start off um, eating what uh, is commonly called the standard American diet. The acronym might be significant. Um, <laughs> It's, uh, it's obviously, it's, it's a diet that's fairly heavy in animal products. It's also a diet that's mass produced. And significantly, it's a diet that's inexpensive, uh, which of course is a good thing. Um, people have been trying through most of that evolutionary history just to get enough to eat. And there's no doubt that the American diet provides most Americans, virtually all Americans really, with enough to eat. Uh, so that's a good thing, but is there more to say? So then there are other options. Um, there's the vegetarian option that's been around for quite a long time. People are familiar with that to a certain extent as to what you might avoid eating, avoid eating meat. We know people who have been vegetarians for centuries for a variety of reasons, uh, religious health reasons, and also uh, relating to animals. The next category, the vegan diet, is something that probably 10 years ago most people would have said, What's that? What does that term mean? And it's really interesting, I think, the way that term has at least been more widely understood over the last decade, um, largely due to the fact that uh, the animal movement has been promoting it to a large extent. Um, also, some people are promoting it on health grounds as well. But So I think people now understand that a vegan is a person who doesn't eat any animal products and that it is possible to live that way. Of course, whether you should eat that way is another question entirely. And then we've had uh, uh, a large boom also in organic uh, food production. Um, so this has been the, the fastest growing section of uh, agricultural production in the United States over the last few years. Um, and there's clearly a question as to whether that's what we should be doing. Is that the direction we should be going in making those choices? Also, quite recently, we've had a focus on the idea of eating locally. Um, there's even an, a term for it now, the locavore, a um, person who just uh, eats stuff that comes within a certain distance, and the defining distance varies a little. Is it 100 miles? Is it 500 miles? Uh, people set different standards. But eating from your local area rather than uh, more widely, is that a good thing to do? Why do people want to do that? Um, should they do that? And then, uh, not very well known in this country as applied to food in general, but 
known for, for coffee and tea at least, is the fair trade movement. The idea that we should be eating uh, uh, products that are fairly traded, whatever that term might mean, and it has a specific definition. Uh, and in Europe, for example, there is a wide range of foods that have the fair trade label, much more widely available than in this country, although uh, there's been some growth in it here as well. So I want to briefly uh, look at all of those things, but I also want to make sure that I leave enough time for some questions and discussion at the end, so I might have to go fairly quickly over some things. But if I pass something that you think is important, well, just remember it and uh, get in early at question time and you'll be able to, to raise it. Okay, so these are the issues that I want to focus on particularly. Um, so uh, the animal issue, as Professor DeVos said, is something that I've written about for many years, um, looking at issues about how we ought to treat animals. Uh, I think that's important, and I'm going to start with that. The environmental question is something that we've paid more attention to recently, and uh, we have been hearing about the global food crisis uh, over the last few months uh, in particular, and that's also something that we ought to look at. So, animals. Um, the first important start, and I think it's, it's, it is obvious to most of us, but needs to be said, is that at least uh, some non-human animals are conscious beings. By that I mean they have experiences. They are subjects of experiences. Uh, and uh, in particular, of course, they can feel pain, they can suffer in other ways, or they can enjoy their lives. And if you want to know, say, well, how do we know that? This, very briefly, are the three major reasons. You can look at their nervous system, their anatomy, uh, what physiologically changes in situations where they might be feeling pain. We can watch the way they behave. And we know that we come out of the same evolutionary past, it would be strange if we have evolved with a similar nervous system and a similar anatomy and similar behaviour and it doesn't work in, in the same way, that it somehow works in a completely different way. So, so when we put our hands into a fire, we pull them out because we feel pain. We watch an animal put its paw into a fire and it pulls it out quickly and we know the same things go on in its nervous system, but somehow it's completely different, it, it's not feeling pain. Um, that's not impossible, but it would be something that would need to be explained. So I'm going to take it as assumed, unless you, someone wishes to challenge me in question time, that uh, there, are, uh, there, there is pain in animals, they can feel pain and they are conscious beings. Now, that's not of all animals. Uh, I think it's, it's fair to say that uh, in this list, the case for saying that there is a capacity to feel pain and there is consciousness um, is in descending order of strength. So I would say that case is overwhelmingly strong for mammals and birds. In fact, I would say it's extremely strong also for vertebrates. Uh, when you get to invertebrates, you might want to be a bit more selective. You might want to say, well, some of them show behaviour that makes it seem that they're conscious, but couldn't necessarily say that about all of them. Uh, crustacea, for example, uh, they have a quite different nervous system from us. Uh, uh, not a single, not, not centrally organised in a single brain in the way that ours is. Uh, can we be sure that they feel pain? Well, maybe, you know, not sure in the sense that we can be sure that birds and mammals feel pain. Uh, but perhaps we can still think it's quite probable that they feel pain. Um, but if you get down to clams and oysters, the nervous system is so rudimentary and there isn't really the kind of behaviour that you can see associated with pain in the other animals, maybe you want to say no. Maybe you can say, look, I can't say it's impossible, I can't exclude it for sure, but seems unlikely that clams and oysters are capable of feeling pain. I don't know, a certain amount of agnosticism, but mostly what I'll be talking about anyway is about uh, vertebrates. So I think the case is strong. Now, what is the ethics of how we ought to treat animals? What I've put up here is some traditional views uh, looking at some of the, the great philosophers of the past um, and what they have said about how we ought to treat animals. And if you read these, you'll see that they are not very sympathetic to taking animal interests seriously. Um, 
we get Aristotle saying that uh, the whole of nature is a sort of a hierarchy in which the lower forms of life exist for the sake of the higher forms and so the plants exist for animals and the brute beasts exist for the sake of man. What I left out here is that the barbarians exist for the sake of the more rational civilized beings which Aristotle used to justify slavery. Um, but uh, it's, it's all a hierarchy and this is just part of the same hierarchy. Uh, for Aquinas, um, he takes, uh, although he also follows Aristotle to some extent, here in this quote, he takes uh, the idea of, of God's dominion uh, as recorded in Genesis, he takes as meaning essentially that we can do what we like with the animals. It's uh, obviously an interpretation and not the only possible interpretation of that line in Genesis, but that's how Aquinas uses it, and that has had an enormous amount of influence in Christian thinking since uh, Aquinas. And then we get to Immanuel Kant, uh, still regarded as one of the great philosophers, one of the great ethicists, uh, saying that, um, well, it's self-consciousness that's really important, and uh, everything else, animals, are just merely a means to an end, that end being us. So animals not being self-conscious, um, we have no direct duties to them. And the only reason that Kant gives for against cruelty to animals is that if you're cruel to animals, you might develop a disposition that would make you cruel to human beings as well. The animals themselves are not ends. It's only if it would have these sort of spillover bad effects on human beings that it would be wrong. Uh, and Aquinas also actually says, says something similar. Not all Kantians, I should say, take this view. One of the, the leading modern Kantian philosophers, uh, Professor uh, Christine Korsgaard at Harvard, um, thinks that Kant has made a mistake here. Although she generally is a Kantian, she thinks that uh, this particular argument is just wrong. You don't need self-consciousness to be an end. You just need consciousness. So that's the background, and I mention that because these are thinkers that have formed the Western tradition. So if we feel some resistance to some of the things that I want to go on and say, maybe it's because these ideas still have a pull over us, that we haven't really freed, us, freed ourselves from ideas of the past. But, it's not, but they're not the, the mainstream view today. This is much more like the mainstream view, that um, we do have some duties to animals. It's not that we have no duties to them. Um, we have duties to be kind to them and to avoid being cruel to them. And we condemn cruelty in various forms. And this means that their interests count, but they're also easily overridden. And they're overridden by our own interests in various ways. Uh, for example, and this is the most important example that I'll focus on, for example, in producing that inexpensive food that I mentioned at the beginning, cheaply producing meat or eggs. Well, here's one question. If we take that mainstream view, is modern farming compatible with it? The way we actually treat animals. So is there, even without going into a different philosophical approach to animals, is there a problem with the way we treat animals? A lot of people wouldn't really know how to answer that question because they don't actually know very much about how we treat animals today. And here's a quote not from uh, anyone uh, working for people for the ethical treatment of animals or any radical animal rights group, but uh, someone who's a professor of animal science at Oregon State University uh, who basically spends his living uh, teaching people who are interested in uh, animal agriculture. Uh, and in some way or other likely to have careers either raising animals or uh, working in some way with uh, animals that are being used in agriculture. And yet Professor Cheek says that most people don't really know how animals are treated and if they did then uh, as he says some perhaps many of them would swear off eating chicken and perhaps all meat. So there is a question about the ethics of our food system already raised there, even before we go into details. Is there something wrong with a society 
which doesn't really know how its most common foods are produced. Shouldn't we at least know that? Don't we have a responsibility to be aware of how our food is produced so that we can decide whether or not there is an ethical question that's raised about it? And Professor Cheek agrees with that. Uh, he thinks that transparency is an ethical indicator and is troubled by the lack of it in uh, the industry and in the United States today. And that's not an accident. I mean, it is actually quite difficult to get inside um, these places. It's particularly difficult to get inside with uh, TV cameras if you do it in an open, legitimate way. I've had, um, I've had uh, television programs saying that they would like to uh, interview me on some topic about animals, and they said, look, we'd actually think it'd be interesting if we interviewed you with an animal. And I said, well, you know, look, that's, that's fine, but um, I don't want to just be there with a dog or a cat sitting on my lap um, <laughs> because, you know, those are not really the issues that I'm most concerned about. They are not the worst treated animals in the United States today. If you want to do an interview with me, let's go inside, let's say, an egg producing unit where there are, you know, the typical one that is responsible for about 98% of the eggs produced, um, and I'll show you a photo of it in a moment, and, and let's do the, do the interview there, or a, a pig farm or something like that. They say, sure, great idea, that's terrific, just a moment, we'll, we'll line one up and then we'll call you back. Then they call back a few days later apologetically, look, we're, we're really sorry, we're a bit surprised by this, but we can't find anyone who will let our cameras into their farm. Well, I was, I'm not surprised because I've, I've got used to this. Um, they are deliberately secretive. And the, the footage that you get, if you get it, you can get it on the web from a lot of the animal groups, is taken by people going in illegally, trespassing, uh, with, or, or getting employed undercover in these places and going in with hidden cameras. Um, so the industry has actually made it its business not to be transparent. But here is what the chicken is like that uh, Peter Cheek was talking about. This is a standard chicken producing shed. If you see it's a vast long shed. It has um, probably typically 20 to 25,000 chickens in it. Um, they're pretty crowded. Um, they have no hope of uh, sort of getting to know a group of chickens which is sort of normal for, for chickens growing up. They normally have a flock size uh, you know, 30, 40, maybe up to 60 or 80, and they can learn to identify that many individuals and kind of know their place in the group, but obviously not with these sort of numbers. And also with these sort of numbers, there's clearly no individual attention to birds at all. Um, there can't be. It just wouldn't, it wouldn't pay economically, um, given how cheap they are. So uh, all sorts of things go wrong in these systems. These are very fast-growing birds. The... Uh, the typical chicken that's produced in this and then sold at the supermarket is 42 days old when killed. Uh, so it's really a baby. But it's a very big baby because we've selected these birds uh, over many, many generations to grow very, very fast. Uh, and that's the economics of it. That's the cheapest way to produce them. But one of the results is that their bones are still immature. And they grow to this weight that you, whatever it is when you buy them, four to five pounds, um, and their legs often can't actually hold them and their legs may crumple under them and they may just collapse onto the floor, unable to walk. Now, if that happens when they're far away from these, uh, the lines of the feeding pipes that carry food and water, if that happens when they're far away from the feed and they can't get water, they're just going to die of thirst. Um, and nobody is going to come through and say, oh, there's a sick bird, I better do something about that. Not even, I better pick it up and wring its neck. Um, generally speaking, They'll go through and pick up the corpses every now and again because uh, otherwise they decay and they get maggoty and so on. But, um, uh, you know, mostly they, they are there until they're dead. Uh, there's another shot of the same sort of thing, more from the bird's eye level. And uh, the same sort of thing happens to turkeys. We're not that far from Thanksgiving, so you might like to think about what sort of turkey you're getting. This is, again, the vast majority of turkeys are produced in the same indoor sheds as uh, the chickens are. There's one interesting difference. We've bred turkeys to have such large, bre large breasts that they are now physically unable to mate, the typical turkey that is uh, sold in, in supermarkets. So every turkey that 
not every turkey, because there are a few places that have heritage breeds that they run around and they can still mate, but let's say 99% of the turkeys that Americans eat at Thanksgiving are the result of artificial insemination, which means that there, is, there are people whose job it is throughout the week to masturbate male turkeys and collect the semen, and there are generally other people whose job it is to take the females, put them in an uncomfortable position where it's possible to inject the semen into them, uh, and do that um, all day with thousands of birds where the more birds they get through, obviously, in a day, the more economical it is, but that's not showing any consideration for the birds. So there's a topic to bring up next Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> okay, let's move on to pigs. Um, this is a, a typical sow stall. Um, this is a, a pregnant sow. She's, she's the, the mother of the pigs who are sold for the prime pork or ham or bacon at, at market. Um, she's basically a breeding machine. Um, she's only profitable as long as she's pregnant um, uh, and very briefly when she's feeding her, her piglets. Um, and she's easiest to manage and she wastes less food and she, uh, you know, uh, so on if she's individually confined like this. Um, uh, so she's basically like this for most of her life, really, or through, throughout the pregnancies. Um, she's not got room to walk around. She's on, here she's on bare concrete, um, because if you provided her with straw, she'd be more comfortable, but you would have to replace the straw every now and again. It would get filthy. That takes labor and costs money. You don't need to do it. She'll still survive like this, um, and you can just hose down the concrete. Uh, these are veal calves. You've probably, more people, I guess, have heard of the veal, intensive veal raising, and there has been something of a move to, to boycott veal as a result. Um, they're also individually stalled, uh, unable to walk around, uh, because that produces the pale, tender uh, flesh, uh, again, most uh, easily and cheaply in those conditions. So they're, they're like this from the uh, from the, the, basically the, the day or the day after they're born, when they're taken from their mothers uh, until they're taken to slaughter at about uh, 14 weeks of age. Uh, it's another, it's a bit out of order, sorry. There's another shot of the sows in a different system. This time they have metal slats to lie on rather than concrete, but you can see more clearly here how crowded they are, how they can't even get their legs into their own stall. They stick out, um, as in this one, they stick out into their neighbour. And this is the uh, farrowing crate, so-called, when uh, the, the, the sow gives birth. She's also confined. Um, again, you could give her straw and she would make a kind of nest. Uh, she has a, sows have an instinct to, to build a nest. Uh, they start doing that normally a couple of days before they give birth. Uh, but that would cost more. Um, you would need more space for them. This is an alternative that holds the sow so that she can't roll over and crush her piglets. Um, and again, you can see this time, rather than being a, a breeding machine, she's a milking machine for the piglets. She normally you know, would be sort of curling around and uh, holding them to her in the ways that mammals do with their, with their uh, children, but she's not able to do that on this system. And these are the, these are the children when they're growing a bit bigger. Um, they do have a little more room to move around, but they're still extremely crowded, and it's a very stultifying, boring environment for a highly intelligent, inquisitive kind of animal. And I mentioned the, uh, the egg producers. Um, this is a fairly typical uh, egg unit. Uh, birds are in cages. Uh, they're stacked up on top of each other. Uh, they have very little room to move around. I think I have another one there that shows how crowded they are. Uh, the eggs are collected automatically. It's, it's a labour-saving device as much as anything because the eggs can all be collected automatically. Uh, they sort of roll. The, the cages have sloping fall, floors. They roll down to the front and uh, can be collected uh, from the front there. So what are we to say about this from an ethical perspective? Well, here's a simple argument. that, uh, uh, I said, As I said, I think it's pretty much within the mainstream viewpoint, the view that we shouldn't be cruel to animals. Uh, it seems to be, it seems that, you know, you could take from the idea that we shouldn't be cruel to animals that it's wrong to cause pain to animals without a good enough reason. 
And yet, I think it's clear that they do suffer in these forms of production that I just showed you. And we can discuss that again in question time, but I think there's a lot of evidence. It's not just a sort of emotive response to the pictures you've seen, or even to being in those places. There is a lot of evidence that they're suffering. It's not necessary. I'll show you more about th that before. We can certainly nourish ourselves in other ways. So what is it that's... Why are we doing it? Well, we enjoy the way meat tastes, I suppose, um, and this is the cheapest way to produce it. But I don't think enjoyment of the taste is a good enough reason to justify the amount of suffering that the animals endure. If enjoyment is a good enough reason to justify making animal suffering, then uh, why were we so hard on, on Michael Vick, the, uh, the quarterback who was convicted of dogfighting? After all, no doubt the fans who go to dogfights enjoy the dogfights. Um, and uh, you know, there might be lots of fans and only a, a few dogs who suffer. Um, so why is that enjoyment in some way uh, doesn't justify the suffering, but the enjoyment of the way meat tastes is supposed to justify the much longer and more drawn out suffering of the animals involved. Um, I think it's very difficult to defend this even within that mainstream view. So this seems to be the conclusion that we ought to stop eating the products of modern meat production, of the systems that I've just shown you. Uh, you might say, yes, okay, let's suppose that we accept that. Where should we go from there? Um, well, one thing that we can do is to do something political. Uh, the, uh, the election that we're going to have on November 4th actually has um, not just one but two historic components to it. Uh, obviously, one is uh, whether we will elect an African-American president um, or, for that matter, a female vice president. Uh, but California is voting on a historic initiative that would eliminate uh, three of the things that I've just shown you the uh, individual crates for uh, veal calves, individual crates for pregnant sows, and the battery cage for hens. It does this by simply requiring that it would be illegal to confine animals in a way that keeps them from being able to stand, sit, lie down, turn, turn around, and extend their limbs. Um, and uh, the New York Times recently endorsed Proposition 2 um, and urged, says here, urges other states to enact similar laws. Um, I certainly hope that Proposition 2 passes. It will at least be a start. It doesn't affect uh, the chicken production that I showed you, but at least will be a start in changing animal production. And uh, uh, you might say, well, if California passes such an initiative, why shouldn't Massachusetts and a lot of other states as well? OK, let's move on to the environmental questions. Um, and I will come back to uh, some of the other uh, issues uh, as well later. So. Uh, environmental aspects of our food production, um, again looking here at factory farming, uh, one of the major issues is pollution that it causes, uh, particularly water pollution. There, as you saw, there's you know, thousands of animals, tens of thousands of animals sometimes in confined spaces, a lot of manure that's very confined, and the question is what happens to that? Typically it gets washed down into these so-called lagoons, I used to think when I was a kid that a lagoon was this kind of sparkling blue thing around a tropical island with a, with a coral reef or something. Well, this is apparently a lagoon too. Uh, um, and it's, it's uh, full of animal feces. And, uh, of course, ideally it's supposed to treat it so that nothing happens. But very often it doesn't. Very often there's a storm, they break down, they flood, uh, they leak out, and uh, there's a lot of pollution in our rivers. In fact, one of the major reasons why uh, rivers across the United States are often not fit uh, to, for, for people to swim in, for instance, is uh, agricultural pollution from, uh, from animal industries. Here's another uh, uh, sh different sort of shot of, of this kind of thing. This is a, a, a pig farm now, um, but you can see the scale of it here, what a huge thing it is. Uh, so this place here has... Um, one of nine sites with 8,000 or nearly 9,000 hogs per site. This is an enormous concentration of animals of a sort that earlier generations never had. And then you have these uh, retaining lagoons uh, uh, around it uh, with a lot of huge amounts of, um, of manure in those areas. 
So it's partly the scale and the concentration of what we're talking about that creates the problems. And then there's the question of climate change. So this is a, um, a cattle feedlot um, out, in, out in the Midwest. Um, it stretches to the horizon, as you can see. You can't even see the end of it. Uh, there's a vast number of, of cattle here. Um, and cattle in particular, ruminant animals generally, of which cattle are the main examples, are major emitters of methane. Their digestive system produces a lot of methane. And methane is an extremely potent greenhouse gas. Uh, typically people say methane is 25 times as potent as carbon dioxide. In fact, over a sh the short term, over say a 20 year time frame, which is going to be critical in, in our battle to stop passing irreversible tipping points in climate change, uh, over a 20 year time frame methane is about 70 times as potent as carbon dioxide. So. Um, the, the increase in the number of cattle we've had because we're eating so much more beef uh, is a significant contributor to uh, climate change, uh, to America's greenhouse gases in the world. And some of that debate that we've had about uh, uh, climate change has refused to focus on this. So you get a lot of discussion about energy and transport and so on. Very few people are prepared to talk about doing something about um, animal production, and in particular beef production, to cut down our greenhouse gases. Um, it's also, as I said, uh, wasteful of grain. I said before that we didn't need to take part in factory farming. And a lot of people say, well, the population is growing, we've got a, a growing world, don't we need intensive farming to feed the world? But that's the reverse of what we're doing. What we're doing is taking in a lot of grain and feeding it to animals and getting a small amount of food out at the end of it. So we grow all of this grain, but we feed most of it to animals. Uh, we feed a lot of soybeans to animals as well. And on average, it takes six pounds, not just of grain, but of feed protein to produce one pound of meat protein. So it's actually the reverse of being a solution to global food problems. It's exacerbating those problems by forcing up the price of grain because of what we're prepared to pay for the meat that comes out of it. Here's another way of looking at it. Um, that is, how much could you get off an acre from growing different crops? How much protein could you get? Again, not just how, much, how many calories could you get, um, but how much protein could you get? And on the left we have uh, soybeans, which are by far the most efficient way of producing protein from an acre of land. Rice, corn, legumes, wheat, milk. So it's only when you get down to here that you're even getting to uh, animal products at all. You get to milk and eggs, which are the most efficient of animal products, but still much less efficient than the plant products. And then you get to beef right at the very end. So what is causing the world uh, the food crisis? What is causing the increase in grain prices, which occurred earlier this year, and though it's prices have dropped a bit, um, they are still historically high. A lot of people have blamed ethanol. Um, they said, well, we're, we're using grain to make biofuels and uh, that's forcing up the price. And it's, it's got some role in that, undi undoubtedly. We used about 100 million tonnes of grain to turn into ethanol and uh, that's grain which people could have eaten and has again forced up the prices. But compare that with the amount of grain we're feeding to animals um, and it's one-seventh, one-eighth of the quantity. So the grain we're feeding to animals is a bigger contributing factor in uh, pushing up the price of grains. And particularly as the Chinese follow our example, as they've become more prosperous and they eat more meat and they copy our styles of raising animals, then they also demand grain for the animals that they're raising and the price goes up. And I think it's clear that uh, it's simply not possible for everyone in the world to eat the quantities of animal products that we're eating. There just wouldn't be enough agricultural land to produce the quantities of grain and soybeans that would be needed to feed to those animals in order to produce that quantity of meat. So we are living in a way that is 
uh, cannot be equitably spread around the world and sustained. And that obviously raises an ethical question about it. Let me just go back to climate change uh, uh, for a moment. Um, here's a report from the Food and Agriculture Organization, a branch of the United Nations, um, which talks about the fact that the livestock sector is actually responsible for more greenhouse gas emissions as, or, uh, uh, as measured as the equivalent of carbon dioxide than uh, transport. Uh, and yet, as I said, it's, it's, we typically talk more about uh, transport. Of course, power generation is actually bigger than either of these two. Um, and Jim Hansen, who's the scientist who's played a key role in alerting people for the last 20 years to uh, the problem of climate change, has actually said that he thinks that the global warming trend that began in the 1960s was primarily the result of uh, CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, which we basically stopped producing now because of the damage they do to the ozone, and methane. Um, he says, because these gases produce only warming. What he's saying there is, of course we put a lot of CO2 into the atmosphere, carbon dioxide, but power, coal, uh, when, we, when we burn coal, we also produce these things called aerosols, uh, basically soot, small fine particles, which actually have a cooling effect when they stay up in the, in the atmosphere because they block sunlight. And so he thinks that although in the long run we certainly have to deal with the carbon dioxide from coal fuel powered stations, um, probably the actual rising trend has come much more from methane and CFCs because there's no aerosols attached and that's why they're like more a, a pure, more pure influence on warming. And conversely, if we cut them, we could slow the warming much more rapidly than if we cut electricity generation from coal-fired power plants because then we cut the aerosols as well and that would have a, a dual effect. And here's the chair of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, again the uh, sort of leading United Nations uh, based authority on climate change, actually starting to say only at the beginning of this year that uh, meat is a very carbon intensive commodity and we should eat less of it. So I think that we have to focus more on this ethical issue even if it's politically difficult for people to do so. Now here's another comparison uh, by a couple of scientists, uh, Gideon Nichelle and Pamela Martin, tried to calculate, so how much would you save if you switched your typical American family car to a Prius? Um, well, they calculated you'd save about one tonne of carbon emissions per year. That's quite substantial. But suppose you switched from your typical American diet to a vegan diet. Um, you would actually save one and a half tons of carbon per year. So if we think that what you drive is an ethical question, and we're starting to think about that, and I think that's right, we should, then surely what you eat has to be an ethical question. Okay. Uh, I'm going to have to move a little faster to make sure we have time for questions, um, but I did just want to raise the issue. I've talked about factory farming. Could you, ha could you nevertheless be a conscientious or ethical omnivore? Um, could you eat humanely raised meat, uh, maybe organically produced meat, not grain-fed meat, grass-fed meat, and so on? Roger Scruton, who's a conservative British philosopher, thinks that you can, um, thinks that as long as they're well raised, as long as they have good lives, as he says down the bottom here, when all duties of care are fulfilled and the demands of sympathy and piety, he thinks we should have respect for our fellow creatures, are respected, he thinks killing them painlessly is not in itself tragic. Um, and after all, they wouldn't have existed without us. Now, um, I think that that's at least a, a, a tenable kind of view. I think it's at least a view that you could respectably put forward. I'm not going to... Dismiss that. I think that the, the defense of what I've been talking about previously, of factory farming, really there is, no, there is no possible reasonable defense of it. But if somebody says, look, I just would find it very hard to live without meat, but I'm really going to try and follow this view, find animals who have had good lives and have been painlessly killed, and where the environmental impact is as low as possible because they've been grass-fed, that still doesn't solve the methane problem for... Uh, cattle and sheep, by the way. Um, but uh, if you could do that, 
Well, I think you'd at least have made a big step forward. I'm not going to say that that's entirely the right thing to do, but I think it's an important step away from the worst cruelties. And given where we are in this country now, given that we are food production, animal food production is still dominated by factory farming, I think it is a good thing if people make that switch. And uh, if that's as far as they're prepared to go, we should at least give them credit for having taken an important step. So here's an example from not far from Princeton in New Jersey. Um, a, uh, uh, very different from the feedlots that you, you saw. Um, note that the calves are still with their, with their mothers here. Um, they're growing up together. Uh, and it is a sustainable uh, organic farm. And there's an egg production system, which again is very different from what I showed you before. Um, eggs are somewhat more expensive, of course. It's not so labour-saving. A bit of land is needed. But, you know, for a hen, that's, that's, that's a good life for a hen. Now, it's true that they're not going to live long lives. Once their rate of laying drops off, they're going to get killed. But still, while they're there, um, I think they're able to live a life that satisfies their natural instincts in the way that the uh, battery hens certainly were not. Okay, briefly on organic food. Um, I think there are strong ethical reasons for preferring organic food. It is sustainable in the long term. Uh, it's less energy intensive. Um, it doesn't use synthetic fertilizers, herbicides and pesticides. Um, and that's better for the environment, better for biodiversity, um, uh, and uh, doesn't cause the same pollution problems. Um, organic standards in this country do not allow genetically modified plants or animals. Um, that's actually controversial as to whether that's a good or a bad thing. Um, it might put organic farming under a disadvantage uh, as, for example, pest-resistant genetically modified plants are available and uh, may be more difficult to avoid using um, pesticides without those modifications. But there's obviously there's a, there's a debate about GM foods both for health reasons and for environmental reasons. And if you want to raise that question in discussion, we can do so. Uh, no antibiotics, steroids or hormones. Uh, that's good for your health, I think. Probably also good for the environment because it's been shown that steroids, for example, which are routinely fed to standard beef cattle, I mean, all of those cattle in the feedlot picture you saw would have had steroids implanted to make them put on muscle, in other words, the desirable meat, more rapidly, uh, it's been shown that that gets into streams nearby. Uh, the animals urinate, the steroids come out in their urine, um, it, go, it may be washed off the feedlot or it may collect in those lagoons that leak, uh, it gets into the rivers and it's been shown to affect uh, fish in the rivers uh, and may well affect uh, other uh, animals that uh, take water from the river conceivably even us. Um, as I said, in theory, according to organic uh, farming standards, animals must be able to go outside during suitable weather. But it doesn't always work that way. This is one of the largest organic dairies in the country, uh, Aurora Dairy uh, in uh, uh, Colorado, not far from uh, Denver. Here's how they advertise. And here's the reality um, from the air. Uh, it's a huge unit where the cows, although they can go outside, are in these, uh, each of these things is a, is a large shed um, and then there's a sort of a dirt paddock outside. So there's no pasture because there's far too many cows in that area uh, for any grass to survive. The only time they're on pasture is when they're not giving milk um, and for most of their productive lives uh, they are being milked. So uh, I think the the boundaries of organic, as you might expect, have been pushed by some of the larger corporations that have gone into that. Which is not to say that it's all fake or all a swindle. People are trying to push back and uh, tighten up the rules. And uh, I think most organic farmers do play by the rules. But the, you, know, you need to be constantly vigilant. And here's an organic um, uh, egg producing unit, actually not that far from here, up in uh, Munro, New Hampshire. Um, and look, it's, it's very crowded, as you can see here. These birds are still in a shed. Um, I actually took this photo myself. I visited the farm around this time of year because uh, I was up in this area to enjoy the foliage change um, uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, this is a farm, uh, a unit that is actually very open, unlike most, was happy to show me around, happy for me to take photos. 
Um, but it was a pleasant, it was a more pleasant day than today. It was probably more like yesterday when I was there. A little colder maybe, but, um, but sunny. But the birds were all inside. The doors were closed. Um, and he said, well, he basically he'd closed up for the winter. And it turned out he didn't really like his birds going outside because he was worried that they might get bird flu from uh, wild birds that could fly overhead, that could uh, leave droppings, that they could uh, get uh, uh, avian flu from. It's a theoretical possibility. I think it's a remote chance, but um, uh, that was, was his reason. So the birds are still in sheds. They're still, pr still pretty crowded. Um, it's still, they're still much better off than the birds in cages, no question about that. Um, they look healthier, they're, they're less scared, uh, they've got their feathers on which get worn off in the cages, um, but it's not quite what you might have imagined an organic egg production would, would be. Okay, what about this local stuff? Um, why should we buy locally? Well, people say support your local economy, support endangered family farms, protect the environment, build a relationship with your supplier. Yes, those are all good things. Does it really protect the environment? It will depend whether what you're buying. For example, if you want to eat uh, locally grown uh, tomatoes, um, if you want to eat them now or over the last three months, that's great. They were probably grown naturally, um, uh, used less energy than transporting them up from Florida or California. But are you content to just have tomatoes from July to October? Probably not. Probably you want them in, in June or May or other times like that. If you're buying locally produced tomatoes here in June, they've been grown with heat. You have to heat the greenhouse to get them. Uh, and if you do that, you're probably burning just as much oil as it would take to truck them up from Florida where you don't need to produce heat. So it's not always better. It depends on what you're buying. Uh, and you would have to say eat locally and seasonally to really make sense in terms of environmental protection. Um, is it always better to strengthen the local economy? Well, that links to the question about fair trade. The local economy might be a relatively prosperous one, that's nice, but there are other people in other countries who need to have something to sell to us if they're going to get beyond a basic subsistence level. If they're going to be able to buy books for their children to go to school with, for instance. Um, so uh, are we favouring our own, those close to us, at the cost of those who maybe are in greater need? And that's where the fair trade issue comes in. Um, we have this little label, fair trade certification, because um, people will say, well, sure, I would buy stuff from developing countries, but how much of it really gets to the poor? how much of it is not swallowed up by the corporations. And that's a good point. But if you have the fair trade label, you know that either this came directly from the producers, small peasant producers, who were paid a fair price for their product, that is a price calculated to enable them to live and to raise a family on the return they can reasonably expect to get from their crops, or if it did come from a corporation, the corporation had to pay a living wage to its workers, had to provide them with decent housing if they were not living at home, had to protect them from sexual harassment and uh, provide them with uh, some basic health care and so on. So if you do see this certificate, this label, you know that your purchase is actually going to give people in developing countries a decent income and a decent life. And I think that that's a justifiable reason for buying non-locally where you can get those products. Typically, of course, the fair trade label is on products we can't produce locally anyway. Coffee, cocoa, chocolate, bananas, we don't grow in this country. But um, uh, it is being extended and no doubt it will be applied to some products that we do grow here. I think that it's still worth, uh, worth doing. Okay, so let me conclude because, as I said, I wanted to have time for questions. These are the, the quick conclusions, the quick summary. I think clearly we ought to be avoiding products from CAFOs, that stands for Concentrated Animal Feeding Operation. It's basically the industry term for factory farm. Um, I think uh, it's preferable to eat organically, to uh, at least be a vegetarian, vegan or conscientious omnivore. Um, and if you push me, the, maybe the vegan option is the best of these, but uh, I know that 
Depending where you are, that may seem a leap. Other people, it seems easy. Uh, that's, that's something that people get to in their time. I think definitely better to buy fair trade where you can. And local, sure, depending on what you're buying, when you're buying it, and wh what the area that you're, what the options are that you have available, and what the area you're in is. So uh, I apologize that that's been fairly quick, but I'm told that we're going to have to finish at 8.15. We got started a few minutes late. So let's go straight to questions. Uh, I've also been told that it's a policy here to give students the chance to ask the first uh, two or three questions. So let's see whether we have questions from students. And then after a couple of those, I'll throw it open to everyone. Oh, thank you. Okay, do we have any students? Yes. There. You're going to have to speak nice and loud because you don't have a mic. Yeah. What are your lingering objections to being a conscientious omnivore? Okay. Um, I'll repeat the question in case probably at the back you can't hear. What are my lingering objections to being a, a conscientious omnivore? Well, for one thing, to some part, some degree they're practical. I think it's really difficult to maintain respect and consideration for animals that are part of a commercial enterprise. Uh, that is, you're trying to make a living from them, uh, they become a commodity, and can you really maintain an attitude where you are caring for their interests as fully as you should? Now, I don't say it's impossible, right? I'm, and I, I'm sure there are some farmers who can do it, but typically they do it on a small scale and um, you're never really going to be able to feed a large population from that kind of production, I regret to say. So if you encourage people to be conscientious omnivores, you're effectively saying to them, it's all right to continue to eat meat, but that's not something that everybody could do because we wouldn't be able to meet the right standards. So I think that if you wanted to have an attitude that encourages people to get to a, a solution that we could have across the whole country, it's really more, more, more practical, more workable to move to not consuming animal products at all. Now, that perhaps doesn't go to the, the philosophical, you know, the deep philosophical question is, is it wrong to kill animals that are living a good life? And Roger Scruton would say, well, it's not, it's not wrong if they wouldn't have existed otherwise, right? So, so you say, look, if somebody says it's wrong to kill these animals, then the farmer says, well, if I can't kill them, I've got no reason to breed them. Um, you know, I have to convert my farm to something else uh, because I can't make a living from it. So it's kind of trying to balance killing but giving them a happy life with them not existing at all. And that is one of those strange philosophical questions where you say, well, how can you compare non-existence with, with existence. Right? Um, it's a bit like, you know, we can ask the same question about humans. Is it, is it if, if a couple are thinking about having a child, they're not sure whether they really want to have a child just from themselves, um, but they're comfortably off, they could give the child a good home and they're living in a country like the United States where most people can have a good life. And somebody said, look, you ought to have a child because the child will have a happy life. And if you're indifferent, that should be enough to swing the decision for you. And that seems a little strange, isn't it? Um, well, for the child's sake, but if the, if the child, if we don't have a child, the child won't exist, the child won't miss out. So that's the kind of question that is going on when you say it's okay to kill the animals because otherwise you wouldn't have brought them into existence. And, and um, I think, you know, I, I don't say that in a way of saying that it's, it's just stupid or, or impossible to run that argument. I just think that it's a difficult sort of argument to run and you really have to follow through those kinds of ramifications. So that, that's, that's where the philosophical discussion would go, but I think in practical terms, as I say, there are, there are more immediate objections. Okay, we have another question from a student? Yes, there. Um, thanks for this talk, this is beautiful. Uh, my question is that uh, since we recovered from those mass production to organic food, isn't that the huge demand will eventually lead to uh, mass production in organic food, and then it's going to be again this huge farm with trading animals badly. 
Okay, so the question is how are we going to balance, if, if organic continues to grow more popular as it has been, how are we going to balance that with the idea that then we'll have mass production of organics, large corporations, huge numbers of animals on site, and so on. I think if we really can enforce proper organic laws um, you know, and not have the kind of dairy that I showed you, we can still have a system that's substantially better than the present one. Because if we require that animals are on pasture, for instance, you know, you can't maintain pasture if you have a dense concentration of animals, whether it's chickens or cows or whatever. Um, there's just too many. They kill all the grass. So if you really had that standard, you're going to have to spread them out. You'll have to use more land, of course, to produce it, but you'll have to spread them out, and then you won't have the same problems of concentration of manure and so on. But I think the standards do get pushed a little bit, um, and that's what you have to worry about. Otherwise, uh, yes, we could end up with a kind of industrial organic which doesn't use the uh, pesticides and herbicides and so on, and that's good, that's certainly some advantage, um, but is still going to give rise to many of the problems, not all of the problems, that we have with, with corporate farming. The back there. Um, what do you think is the most effective way to get people to change their habits, especially in regards to perhaps people who can't afford to buy organic or fair trade? Right. Well, uh, so the question is, well, how can you get people to change their habits, especially those who can't afford to buy organic or fair trade? Um, it's true that those products are a bit more expensive. Um, you know, this is the, the, the other side of the question that I just answered is, if you do get large-scale organic, it gets cheaper. And when Walmart goes into organic, although it may push the limits, it does, you know, it's cheaper than buying them at Whole Foods. No question. So um, the difference can shrink. Organic can come close to competing in some areas, not in all foods, but in some areas it can come close to competing on price. Uh, also, um, you know, although it's true that we've made uh, things like chicken and eggs very cheap, um, a vegan diet can also be very inexpensive if you know how to do it. If you, if you buy um, dry foods, for example, dry pulses, uh, lentils and beans and so on, are a very inexpensive form of protein. Um, and dry grains are too. So if people know a little bit more about how to cook, how to prepare tasty me meals from those foods, I think uh, that can work. Um, but, you know, it's a, it's a difficult question. One of the problems, I think, is to get the intensive farmers to pay the full price of what they're doing. And, and one of the reasons that food is so cheap is they're not paying the full price. They're not paying for the pollution that they put out, for instance. They're not paying for the greenhouse gases. You know, we've been talking about cap and trade system for greenhouse gases. If that included all the emissions from agriculture, then that would be a factor that would make the uh, factory farmers have to contribute more. So uh, in a way, they're getting away with things too cheaply. And I think that if we can do that, then we'll, we'll change that, that price gap and more people will shift to an ethically better and more sustainable way of eating. Okay, I'll take one more student, um, that'll be you, and uh, then we'll open it up to others as well. Um, do you consider it is ethical to allow the existence exist of animals, say cattle, that will pollute the environment and eat the grain that could feed human beings, <coughs> regardless of whether we eat them or not, to continue to allow uh, the existence of cattle? All oh, right, so the question is whether it's, it's ethical to allow cattle to continue to exist given that they're eating grains and um, uh, belching up methane. Um, so, look, the reason that there are so many cattle, of course, in the world is because we eat them. Um, I mean, if there were as many cattle in the United States as there were bison, uh, we wouldn't have a problem. Bison today, I mean, right? Um, so uh, I don't want species to become extinct, um, whether they're tigers or cattle. Um, but I certainly think that it would be better if we had far, far fewer cattle. It would be better for the world. And so uh, I would say, yes, you know, you're right. It's not ethical to have them in anything like the numbers that we have. It would still be ethical to keep some herds just so that we keep the species and even some of the ver varieties of breeds that we've got actually going. 
but, but that's as much as it should be. Okay, so now we're open to everyone. Yes? I haven't touched on fish, you're right. And what else did you say? Oh, well, the role that plays in our diet, yes. Okay, that was really just for time, you're right. Um, uh, so, is, is it better to eat fish than to eat uh, other animal products? Might be one way of, of putting that question. Um, well, there's, there's different things at stake, again, depending where the fish come from. Uh, it's, in one sense, clearly better if we're talking about wild-caught fish. At least we haven't interfered with them until we kill them. They've led a natural free life until the moment when they're hauled up in our nets and, and killed. Uh, that's good. Um, the, the, killing is, the, the killing itself is not humane. There's no humane killing for fish. They die slowly. Depending whether they're deep sea fish, they actually die from decompression as they're hauled up from the bottom. Uh, otherwise they may die from suffocation. Uh, neither of them are pleasant or quick. Um, the other issue is sustainability. Uh, I mean, we fished out a lot of the stocks of the oceans, and uh, I think the only, you know, even if you think that it's okay to eat uh, fish, the only wild-caught fish that you ought to eat would be those from a sustainable fishery. There's something called the uh, Marine uh, Stewardship Council, which certifies fish, uh, fisheries, and if you uh, buy fish that comes from those certified fisheries, at least it's sustainable. You're not wiping out fish stocks as we've been doing for the last uh, century or more. Um, there's also the question of uh, fish farming. Typically that's also not sustainable in much the same way that factory farming is. Where you're talking about carnivorous fish, which are things like salmon and, uh, and tuna, the, the, the fish that we mostly farm, um, they are carnivorous fish and we actually have to go out and catch more fish in order to feed it to them. It's the same old business, you know, two tons of fish have to be caught to produce one tonne of salmon. So uh, it's still a problem for the ocean's ecology. The only fish farming that might be seen as sustainable is the farming of uh, um, fish that, don't, that are not carnivorous, uh, like catfish, for example, uh, which quite a lot is done in China, um, and some here. So there then the question would be about, well, you're still causing suffering to them when you kill them. Uh, is that enough reason for not eating them? Uh, personally, I think it should be. but. Um, it is at least better than eating animals who've been made to suffer for uh, all of their lives. Okay, we'll go right up the back there. Yes, there. Um, I, I take exception to some extent, and I speak from experience. Uh, many years ago, I was a vegan for a better part of a year, and it started out well, and then it got difficult health-wise. And uh, I tried some other diets, had some consultations of a, do a doctor, and ultimately, and you may be familiar with the Weston Price Foundation based in Washington, D.C., and I can't help but thinking that maybe the problem isn't so much um, the ethical treatment of the animals, but maybe we have too many people on the planet, and we have to take into consideration that people have different genetic backgrounds and heritages. What's worked for me, ultimately, I'm primarily of Northern European descent, is saying, I live in the 21st century in America. I don't live 300 years ago in Ireland or in Poland. But I'm still genetically connected enough that what has made me the healthiest the last 10 years, and this is part of the Weston Price take on things, is saying sourdough breads, moderate amounts of meat, saturated fats, and so forth, with exercise and things. Um, so I, I just, you know, I've tried to, to do it with the soy, with the vegan. It didn't work for me. Okay, well, thanks for that comment. Um, I think, you know, I, I, well, let me ask you actually one question. You, you were taking B12, I take it, were you, while you were a vegan? Um, it's 10 years ago, so I can't remember what supplements I was taking, but I'm a graduate of Williams, a science student, and I've been accused at times of being a little too extreme when I take on a project. So I, I tried raw, I tried all sorts of... Okay, let me say, the, the, the one nutrient that you probably can't get, or can't reliably get from a vegan diet is B12, and I would recommend anyone on a vegan diet to take a B12 supplement, which is easy to do. Um, so it's, you know, it's true that it's not a diet maybe that everybody takes to as well as everyone else. Um, I think there are some differences. I've, you know, the large numbers of people, including people of Northern European background, uh, have no problems, are very healthy on a vegan diet, probably healthier than typical people on a typical American diet. But it may be that there's a small percentage of people who don't do well, and then I think 
the answer, you know, I'm not suggesting to anyone that they have to eat, that to eat ethically they have to make themselves ill or not have any energy or something like that. If you're one of that small minority of people, um, you should just figure out how to do the least evil in what you eat, if you like, and, and how to eat the least amount of animal products that will keep you healthy and um, to choose those animal products from the most ethical ones uh, that you can find. One, one quick question. Could you just cite one study that I could go to, and I mean this in all seriousness, that has studied vegan and that I could look at and say, okay, it's a wide study and I can try it again? Uh, look, I can't cite you the study off the top of my head, but go to veganoutreach.org. Um, I think that's a website, and then there's a health section on that you can click on. I think that's a very informative uh, website, and uh, you can get into discussion with the, the people who run it, if you like. They're well-informed, and they have a nutritionist among the people who they work with. Okay, so there was one in the balcony. I thought I should give the balcony a chance, yeah. Um, how does hunting fit in with your ethical concerns, um, especially if you're hunting, let's say, deer in the area where Due to predator extermination, their numbers are extraordinarily high, and in hunting and eating them, you're actually uh, providing an ecological benefit. Right. I mean, we have messed up the environment. There's no doubt about that. And uh, uh, removing predators for uh, animals like deer is a problem. Uh, and it's, it's, a problem, uh, it's probably a problem around here, I imagine. It's a problem around Princeton. Um, uh, they get hit by cars and uh, so on. Um, Look, you know, certainly let me say this, it's far more ethical, if you're a good shot, that is, it's far more ethical to go out and shoot a deer than it is to go down to the supermarket and, and pick up uh, a ham or a, a chicken or something like that. Um, I think a lot of people have it sort of the wrong way around because they see the image of the hunter and uh, they don't see the image of how the chicken or the, the, the pork was produced. Um, I would rather see other methods of controlling deer. I would rather see, you know, as we control, somebody said before, uh, the problem is our population. I actually agree with that too. And we control our population not by randomly shooting people, but by, um, <laughs> by you know, encouraging people to use fertility control. I think we can do that. We could do that for animals. We need a bit of, a bit of science to, uh, to tell us how to do it. But you know, that would be ideal. But admittedly, we don't have it at the moment. And uh, I, you know, there can be cases where animals need to be the numbers need to be controlled. And if we don't have better techniques, the best technique is to get somebody who is really an expert marksman to, uh, to shoot them you know, with a single bullet so that they don't know what's going on. The problem with hunting, of course, is a lot of people are not so expert. You get wounded animals um, uh, and suffering animals. So I'm not actually going to defend hunting, but I can recognize that there are cases where um, killing may not be the greatest evil that you could do. Uh, how about around this side of the room now? Yes, go over there. You've argued that animals are conscious, and most of your evidence supports the fact that factory farming makes their conscious lives un unpleasant. What is it, though, about consciousness um, that makes the lives of animals m ethically relevant? Well, I'd say it's exactly the same as what makes our lives ethically relevant. It's the idea that you could put yourself in their position and know that you wouldn't like this. Um, so it's, that's, you know, that's the golden rule in a way, which is something that's in many different civilizations and cultures, the idea of saying that, you know, put yourself in the position of the other and see how you would like it. So um, we can do that with each other and know that something is wrong that way. Um, we can do that with a pig or a chicken because they're conscious. It's more difficult, of course, um, to know exactly what they're feeling, but we can know that some things, you know, they're looking frustrated, thwarted, they wouldn't like. On the other hand, there's other things like a cabbage that I think you can't do that. You know, you can't say, well, what's it like to be a cabbage being chopped up for a salad? Um, well, it's not like anything because a cabbage, I assume, is not conscious, does not have any experiences. So it doesn't have any kind of negative consciousness. That's why consciousness is relevant. Uh, down the front there, yeah, yeah. Okay, so if I agree, it's important to avoid carbon emissions. But a big question here is, um, how was this product moved to where you are? Okay, if you're buying grapes that were flown in from Chile, say, um, then there's a lot of carbon emissions involved in 
flying a product like that, especially a product that's not a particularly light one. Um, if, on the other hand, you're buying rice that was shipped from Bangladesh, perhaps, um, well, shipping is very efficient uh, in terms of fossil fuels. You can take a lot of rice on a single ship. Um, so you divide it up per pound of rice, um, and it doesn't make that much difference. So I would say, you know, if you could get fair trade rice from uh, somewhere where it's... And, and I mentioned Bangladesh because it's actually very efficiently grown because they have a lot of water coming down the rivers and they have natural irrigation. They don't have to sort of pump it up like you do in California where American rice is grown with much more energy usage. Um, so, you know, you're probably doing better if you live in Los Angeles, say. You probably actually have fewer greenhouse emissions if you buy rice shipped in from Asia uh, than if you buy rice from California. But uh, if the stuff is flown in, it's completely different. And trucking is about halfway between. So you really need to try and work it out in terms of, of how it got there. How are we going for uh, time? We're going to take one last question. I'll take it from right down the front there. It seems to me that right now, um, if I were to buy the thing with ethics, then we would have a surplus amount of grain. What's the most ethical way then to deal with the surplus amount of grain in the sense that um, how would it affect our farmers? And how would it affect the global community with this surplus? Because traditionally, uh, grain has had a huge impact on the global economy. Yes. Yes, right. So if we stopped eating meat, it's quite true that at the moment we would have, you know, if we stopped like right now, we would have a huge surplus of, gr of grain. And that would be pretty disruptive if it really happened suddenly. I mean, gosh, we should be getting used to economic disruption, but I suppose <laughs> we don't need to have a lot more of it. Um, but, you know, realistically, it's not going to happen overnight. It's like the question I sometimes get asked, well, what would happen to all those cattle? You know, you're just going to let them go? Um, or let alone the chickens? You know, my God, all this. Open up all the sheds, millions of chickens running around the countryside. Um, obviously, what's going to happen is people, I hope, will slowly move to more ethical and more sustainable ways of eating. So, gradually, the markets for these products will, will be reduced. People won't breed so many animals. And they won't grow so much in the way of, of crops. Now, what will happen to grain prices and soybean prices is that they will fall. That initially will, of course, be good for people who are poor um, because they will have cheaper bread or cheaper soybeans um, and will be able to nourish themselves better. The market will adjust and people will grow less of this. That also is going to be good for the planet in the long run because some of this area, I suppose, some of it may be turned over to animals initially for pasture, but some of it may also revert to a more natural state. And that's going to help the ecology of the planet if we actually have more biodiversity, more wilderness areas, less pressure on the land, fewer fertilizers being used and going into the rivers. So in the long run, I think it makes for a more sustainable planet. But it's true that it really has to happen gradually or we could have uh, quite serious disruption. Thank you. Thanks very much for your questions.